Okay, welcome to Connexus 365. Uh, this uh, iteration, my name is Gray Taylor. I'm Executive Director of uh, Connexus. Um, it's really my distinct pleasure to uh, focus today on uh, the small and medium business operations within our very entrepreneurial uh, channel. And I'm really happy to have Lisa Del Alba with us. Um, Lisa is a, is a member of the NACS Executive Committee, and she sits on this committee to help uh, frame strategies for the industry. She is an incredibly uh, strong advocate for what happens in the small to medium-sized businesses and some of the headwinds that we have. Um, she operates seven stores north of Philadelphia in the northern Pennsylvania area, and she is a second-generation owner. Um, and she's a really interesting person who's got some really great perspective on what it really takes uh, to, to handle the block and tackle. So Lisa, welcome. Um, Thank <laughs> thanks for coming in and dropping in and, and, and talking to us. Um, so I was saying, that I don't recognize you without your mask. We spent a week down in, um, uh, at the uh, strategy conference and we had a COVID scare and you had to quarantine, um, but you came through clean. So that's the clean living side. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, it's nice to be able to. Do you want me to put my mask on? No, so no, no, that's fine. It's, it's <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for for having me. Um, you know, we, um, you know, as you said, we we run a small business up in Northeast Pennsylvania with seven stores and uh, second generation. And I, I just realized that I've been um, doing this for almost 20 years. So uh, it goes by quickly. And there have been numerous amounts of changes in the industry over the last 20 years. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's been a, a very uh, steep learning curve. And, and just when I think that I've mastered everything there is to master about running convenience stores, uh, you know, something new comes up and, uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm learning all over again, but that's what keeps it exciting. So, so, so we, you know, we've talked a lot over the last month and, and, and um, some of the insights that you have. So, so what do you see as the biggest challenges for, for your operation and, and, and small and medium sized businesses in general, as we move forward in the industry? So, I mean, I think no conversation today should should leave off the table labor. Um, you know, it is it is very challenging right now to fill positions. Um, and, you know, it's it's something that I used to be very you know hands on before I had a family. And, and you know, it was real easy when when Bob on third shift called out, you know, I would just go run third shift, um, you know, and, and, and folks are. <clears throat> looking for, you know, different challenges. I think, I think we've had a value system shift quite a bit since the pandemic started. Mm -hmm. um, people are looking for things that really fulfill them. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think becomes challenging in the, in the retail uh, landscape, and especially in the convenience store industry, is that, um, you know, how do we fulfill that for folks, um, you know, when they're looking for really meaningful interactions and challenges, when we're trying to be efficient, we're trying to be, you know, uh, innovative, you know, especially on a technology front, um, you know, how do we keep those folks engaged? How do we help them grow and develop? And, and you know, what does that look like in the future for, for retention um, kind of strategy for each for each individual? So, you know, I think that's really one of the biggest things that's, that's top of mind for small operators. Um, each region is different. You know, I've, I have one store that's had absolutely no turnover this entire time. And I've had one store that um, when we were all sitting down in the Virgin Islands, I had two employees who then ended up coming down with COVID and uh, we had absolutely none for about a week. So, um, you know, I think I think that's uh, probably, you know, the biggest challenge we have right now. And the other thing is really staying on top of trends. You know, what are we, we talk a lot about, you know, what our employees are looking for and, and what our customers are looking for. Um, and I think that, you know, it, we're moving so quickly that it's hard sometimes as a small business to really keep up with the trends. Um, you know, we are just completing our last EMV outdoor project. Um, they just poured concrete because I did a little, took the opportunity to do a little bit more work um, because we were already going to be closed. So, yeah, they just poured concrete this week. So uh, I'm very excited to be able to close the book on some of those things and uh, really move forward. Um, how, is, how, how is the EMV implementation going for you? Any, any rough spots or has it been you know, pretty smooth? Um, you know, it, it was rough on the labor side because we really had to wait a long time. Um, you know, our petroleum supply company is great and they have wonderful people, but they were also short staffed. Yeah. So, you know, it took a little bit longer um, to implement. And, uh, you know, we have a little bit of a... Of a a learning curve on the user side with our customers. And some of that mm -hmm. is uh, around mobile pay because we have mobile pay capability, but our network does not. 
uh, our software version does not is what I should say. And, uh, you know, so there's, there's, you know, I thought it would kind of be like, a, all right, we got this done and now we're good to go for a little bit, but now we're upgrading POS software, uh, to enable mobile pay. And so it just kind of keeps. <laughs> so, so your oil brand was offering in a mass market, Hey, we've got mobile payment, but your, your stores weren't capable of supporting the mobile yeah. payment at that time. And it wasn't readily apparent. Yeah. So, so, you know, I, I immediately was like, oh my gosh, the mobile pay is not working. And I started placing service calls and, and, you know, I realized that we just didn't have the capability with our software and then, it, and then it became available um, mm -hmm. recently actually. So, you know, and, and, and then we had to upgrade it at internet. Um, well, what we didn't realize going in is how much, uh, you know, all of those transactions are taking up space. Yeah. Um, on that on that highway, if you will. And so I had to go through every single site, find new providers. Um, and it was it was a lot more challenging than I thought. I spent a significant amount of time, um, you know, with Internet providers, uh, just trying to make sure that we had the speed capability to handle all the transactions. So so so, so your brand allows you to, to source your own your own uh, connectivity. And yes. that's kind of up to you to do it. Right. So. Yeah. So that kind of, yeah. All right. So that, that's <laughs> That's not easy. I know people in New York have been waiting for files for 15 years. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so, um, brings up a really good point. So, you've got this brand association, the flag out in front, um, national footprint, really well respected brand. You're different from the other thousands of those folks because you're you're an entrepreneur. What do you think that the major oil brands can do better to accommodate? you know, the things that you want to do in the generic and, and, um, and help you be more successful in your business. Because I mean, to me, it's like, it drives me nuts. I mean, they, they should be able to go out and buy connect connectivity on mass and say, here it is at a discounted price, but you're out there dealing with all these, you know, local monopolies to get it in. Right. Yeah. What other things could happen. That you know, I think a lot of the stuff eventually comes from the oil company, um, but it's almost too late. Uh, you know, it's after feedback from the customer kind of saying, you know, hey, we really need this. And so there are some things, you know, I've gotten some phone calls and I'm like, darn, you know, I already upgraded, you know, my internet and just, you know, signed contracts on all these things. So I can't do this now. Right. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, I see, I guess, you know, my naive self coming into the industry, I, you know, I saw the major oil companies as kind of a hub, uh, you know, for things, you know, information, um, you know, how to best practices, things like that, um, you know, and, and kind of, you know, really connecting us as small operators to the greater, you know, piece of the industry, the things that we need to do to, to be successful and be business partners. Um, and, you know, some of that is around technology. You know, I think one of the things that we're lacking in the industry is, you know, we outsource all of our IT work. Um, I'm no longer uh, comfortable unplugging things and plugging them back in and, and solving all of my own problems. Uh, mm -hmm. It used to be a lot easier 20 years ago. But, you know, I think, you know, sometimes we're outsourcing uh, to IT companies that don't understand the industry and they don't understand the model. And so when you're talking about, you know, PCI compliance or, you know, you're talking about, hey, this is how this needs to work. There's, uh, you know, a significant period of time where they're trying to learn what our business is and, and how things need to operate and the speeds we need um, to make those, you know, connections, especially on the forecourt. So, you know, I think that would be something I would love to see the major oil companies do is, you know, where can I best outsource IT, you know, connectivity, um, you know, and especially when there's a problem, because mm -hmm. when we have a problem, and the way it comes down the pike on the retail side is very different than what the actual problem is. So, you know, we get we get notified that there's a problem because a customer comes in and is upset because their dispenser's not working. Right, and right. then from there, you know, you have to kind of back into what that problem actually is. And so, you know, we're kind of speaking almost two different languages, um, you know, and then, and then if it's an IT issue or something that I need to outsource, um, you know, with our local provider, sometimes it's hard to, for them to understand what the problem is. Cause a lot of people don't understand. Yeah. The 24 yeah. seven must, must always yeah. operate. I mean, yeah. My daughter was stuck. She works. She works as a cashier, and she was she was supposed to complete her shift. We had an ice storm coming. She was supposed to complete her shift at ten o'clock. She didn't get home until twelve thirty in the morning because nobody could get to the store. So they yeah. just asked her to stay because yeah. the store, the show must go on, right? Yeah. And it doesn't matter if your cable system is down, whatever. The show must go on. That's yeah. a tough thing. 
Yeah, you know, oh, is Monday okay? And it's like, no. <laughs> and everything happens on Friday. <laughs> everything goes down on Friday. And then, and then you know, so you're placing calls and people are like, you know, can I can I come Monday? And it's like, no, absolutely not. Like, you need to be there now. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you know, you also were a pretty early adopter at, at moving content out to the dispensers. I think you, you, yeah. you took the advantage of, if, look, if I got to put in EMV, I'm going to do something unique with it. What's your experience like? Has that been a success? Are there improvements? Or, you know, what, what, any kind of learnings on, on pushing content out to the dispenser? Yeah. So, you know, I think we probably picked the worst time in the world to, to try that when, you know, the, the pandemic first started and nobody wanted to touch anything. Um, so. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I think um, it, it, it is a great concept. It is a great program. You know, our customers really like it. Um, you know, it gives us an opportunity. You know, one of the things coming into the industry, because I actually worked in human services before um, I made the leap to the, to the family business. And one of the things that always bothered me was that we have all of these customers and a significant portion of our business are with customers that we never see. You know, so many folks come to the forecourt, they fill up their car, they interact with the dispenser and that, and then, and then they leave. And that's the only representation of our organization, our business, and the way we, you know, we go to market uh, for our company. And so, you know, when you're able to control some of what they're seeing and how they're interacting, um, you know, we, we want them to come in. We want to say hi to them. We want, you know, I had uh, played around with, you know, making sure we talk to every single customer using the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the speaker, you know, out on the island and, and everyone just, you know, Which is um, gone. but it's, <laughs> it's really important. I think as a small business to be able to, to say like, Hey, this is what sets us, sets us apart. Um, you know, for those customers that just aren't coming in and, and, you know, um, not, it's not always a value offer. It's just that they don't have time. And so, you know, what makes us different than the other location down the street that has the same fuel brand? Um, so, you know, it's, um, it's a great opportunity. I think one of the things, again, on the expertise side is that, um, you know, we were fortunate to have a nice, a great partner to work with and kind of say, hey, let's try this together. Um, you know, sometimes when those people leave the companies or, you know, they, they move on to other projects, you know, you're kind of like, wait, hey. <laughs> um, so it does require a lot of time. Um, you know, you have to really kind of think about what content you're putting out there, because if you leave it rolling, um, which unfortunately, sometimes I had to do, if you leave it month to month, the same as people just, it just, it, they become complacent with it. And it's no longer an active conversation. It's a little bit more, you know, kind of like, oh yeah, I saw this last month. Oh, this right. is this guy again, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, and that would be my only thing is that I think sometimes as a small company, we don't have the resources to dedicate to really controlling that the way we should. Right, um, right. So, so yeah, it's, uh, but everyone loves them. Um, they're, they're, if you can call a dispenser pretty, um, those are the, the prettiest dispensers I have. <laughs> so <laughs> Very good. Very good. So, so have you noticed, it, it, has, it, has it driven some people into the store that, you know, your, some of your drive-by customers, they come in to kind of explore the store and learn a little bit more about it? About it? They do. Um, I think sometimes you have to lure them in with free things. Yeah. Um, but that's okay. You know, um, that's, that seems to be the most, uh, active, you know, campaign we have on the dispenser is, is offering a, a free coffee. Right. Um, you know, it really gives us an opportunity to just interact. Um, yeah. and I think we, that's too, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. We, we, well, we had a really cool, we were talking about self-service, um, beginning of the month, right. When we were at the strategy conference, you had some really good perspectives on self-service checkout. Um, you know, a lot of people seem to be bought into it, but you know, you're more of the, oh, I need to talk to my consumers. Tell, tell us what your perspective is on that. Well, you know, I think, um, you know, when we talk about the industry as a whole, one of the things that really comes up, um, often is that we're really, we're a part of the community mm -hmm. and, you know, I think right now, especially, I think we're lacking in significant face-to-face -face connectivity, um, you know, we're, we have gotten so used to talking on screens and using phones and, you know, I'll be the first person to tell you, like, I love Grubhub. I love Instacart because I can get my stuff. People leave it at the door. I don't have to talk to anybody. Um, but at the end of the day, I do think we appreciate interpersonal connection. Um, I think on the employment side, I think it's really important, you know, you get a lot of young people, um, you know, and, and the exposure to the community and the opportunity to interact face to face with customers is so important for de development in any career path. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Because at the end of the day, we're still going to be communicating with someone, you know, even if even if we're completely automated, we're still going to be talking to the service tech or, you know, the the person who is selling us the equipment. So we still have to know how to interact with people. Um, So, you know, I've been very hesitant to be an early advocate for automation because I just I feel like what we do in the convenience store industry is we connect with our communities. And, you know, I was just speaking with a newer um, team member in one of our stores, very, very community based store. Uh, You know, we know the names of every customer that comes in. And, and, you know, my thing has always been, if you know what this guy smokes, then you should know his name. And, you know, it's so I challenge all of them to, you know, introduce themselves and, and, you know, have that person, you know, share with them their name. Um, and, And I think there's something really neat about that. And, you know, I think the more we automate or the more we self checkout, um, the less opportunities we have to do that, or, or it becomes challenging to create those opportunities in another way. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I am a little hesitant to, to say, let's, let's automate every single thing in the convenience store industry, because I think what we do is special. And, you know, I think we are very unique in the communities we serve. All of our communities are very different. And so while we operate with the same value system, um, each store is different and they each kind of have a neighborhood feel and we know who's coming in. And, and that banter is just it's amazing. I absolutely just jazzes me up to come in a store and just see the interaction with the customers and people get playful and, and, you know, tell jokes and it's, it's just, it's fun. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, and one of, one of the takeaways we had, it was one of the other VC members kind of summed it up well, which is like, if, if today takes a hundred, a thousand hours to deliver a good customer experience, we need to figure out how to do it with 750, but it's not all about cutting labor. Yeah. Because customer experience is that soft thing that says, I enjoy going to the store and interacting with folks. Yeah. And that, that to me is the, that's the real fine line of how, how we do it. it I, I agree with you. It's not about just automating the entire front end. It might be about automating everything in the back end so that your people can spend more time on the, the, the dance floor, yeah. um, you know, talking to the consumers. Uh, and then, yeah, there's customers that don't want to talk to anybody. Great. But, you know, I'm with you on that. So it's, I, I like that approach because everybody's just like, well, labor, 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 labor. I'm going to solve this problem by just getting rid of my need for labor. Well, what does that do to the customer experience? And, and how does your brand tie to your own unique customer experience? And I think, you know, there's something to be said for what that does to the employment experience too. You know, if I figure out a way to only employ one person, um, you know, how does that change their work experience? And is that something they look forward to? You know, part yeah. of enjoying your job is interacting with your coworkers. And so, you know, I think we need to be very careful, um, you know, how we dip our toes into some of those things. Yep, absolutely. So um, what do you see on the future? You know, what do you think is interesting from an innovation standpoint? What's, you know, what, what, do you, what are you thinking about and has some interest from you as far as, now nah, we got to look at this? Well, I think you've probably heard me say this before, and I'm sure other folks have as well. But one of the things we have never changed in this industry is the way people buy fuel. Um, you know, so, and, and it's one of the things that even though, and everyone makes fun of me because they're like, aren't you in the gas station industry? Like, isn't this what you do for a living? I hate putting fuel in my car. Like I will, <laughs> I will take my car as far down, like <clears throat> to the point where it won't tell me how many more miles I have left. It just kind of like, you know, <laughs> like there's a triangle with an exclamation. You know, my car gets very angry with me. Um, it's a diesel vehicle. I, I've been told that's not a good idea with diesel vehicles, but I'm going to push the envelope because I hate buying fuel. Um, you know, it, it hasn't, you know, we've probably sped up the delivery, you know, system a little bit, but at the end of the day, you're getting out of your car, you're standing there, you know, maybe interacting with the dispenser, which, which is great, but, but it's, it's not fun. It's you're in the elements, um, which, you know, it's, it's pouring rain here right now in, in Northeast Pennsylvania and it's, it's cold. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not fun. And I would love to see, um, I would love to see our industry develop like almost like a Grubhub or an Instacart system for fuel. (laughs) And I've actually been, you know, toying with the idea of, and this is where being a small business kind of isn't fun is I would love to be able to pilot something like this in my neighborhood where I'm either delivering fuel to you or I'm picking up your car, fueling it up at my store and then bringing it back to you without you having to put your shoes on. Um, But I lack the technology to be able to do that. Right. Um, but I, I think I think that would be something really neat is, is let's bring let's bring fuel to our customers. And maybe I fill up your car with your coffee for the morning and your Snickers bar for lunch or, you know, almost like a like a concierge type of, um, you know, environment and, and system. But, yeah, so I, I think that would be something neat. Um, you know, I, I think 
I don't know. I, I think we have to change the the fuel delivery system in some way, or at least make it more pleasant, like put a dance floor on there, you know, on the forecourt or, or enclose it more. I don't know, but we have not really changed much of that process at all. We've, we've, you know, connected differently. We've, you know, taken mobile. I mean, I think EMV has actually slowed down the, the fueling transaction. Um, you know, and so I, I think we need to delight our customers a little bit more with, with that, you know, chore. Nobody loves buying fuel. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say like, I love, putting fuel in my car. So I, I think well, we're limited to 10 gallons per minute on the delivery. So it's, yeah. You know, it, yeah. You go to Costco, Costco is obsessed about getting it to at least 9.9 .9 gallons per minute. And, you know, so we're kind of limited on that side. So how do you make the experience in general more, you know, more pleasant? I kind of like that, you know, you're, if you're in a population dense area, I think that's a, that's got a lot of, a lot of legs. You could almost call it like a pre-flight checklist for your customers. You got your coffee, you got your donut, you got your car filled up. Oh, yeah, we checked your windshield fluid and you can make it through the, the, the snow today. And it's, so. it's warm in the winter, you know, like I can I can time it perfectly so that, you know, your car is running when you're ready to leave for work. Um, yeah. I don't know. I just I think there's got to be a <clears throat> there's got to be a better way to, to deliver fuel. I have another question, too, because because you are you're you're the technical support of your innovation is paced by the, the brand that you support because they have curation over that. In your estimation, you know, something that you see, you know, as being really, really critical, how long, what's, what's, what kind of time to market for delivery? So you see something that's, you, everybody sees this is really, really important. How long does it take for that to work all the way through the tech and then actually show up in your store? Is it months? Is it years? Well, you know, I think a lot of that depends on our ability to focus in on the project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't know if I can speak well on the on the oil company's delivery side, but, you know, sometimes by the time they get to us to talk about it, by the time we have the time to sit down and really kind of zero in and, and you know, micro focus on a project that you have to kind of deliver from beginning to end. Um, I mean, that could be years. Um, yeah, and, and, really. and, we were and we were talking at the, the conference. I mean, you know, our, our, the new customer, the big chunk of the consumer base going through is 20, 30 years old. Uh, they don't use MasterCard and Visa. They don't use credit cards. They're using Venmo. They're using, yeah. Yeah. you know, I hope we never offer Klarna, you know, buy now, pay later on gas. That's just bad. That's just bad. That would be <laughs> but, but, you know, FinTech, know. Is, FinTech is moving so quickly. I mean, it, it's really very, to me, it's really frustrating that we still have this 1990s payment stack that, takes years to move a new innovation through and yeah. then right across the street, CVS, eh, yeah, well, let's take Venmo. Yeah. And they're doing it. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, for us to do that. And, you know, in, in from a Connexus perspective, and you know this, we're really, we're really focused on how do we, how do we get stuff to connect really, really easy and optimize stack. So we're going to be talking about, um, you know, more about payments as a service. Um, how do we take the complexity out of that so that we can be more nimble? Um, and coupon accepting and so forth and and trying to get, you know, your point of sale vendor and the other point of sale vendors to, to keep up with it. But the oil companies have got to put that on their priority list as well, because I talked to the POS guys and I'm like, hey, <laughs> our dance card's pretty full with EMB support still. Yeah. While we're doing innovation. And that was the other thing. So do you think that EMB has cut back your ability to innovate? Tremendously. Um, and, you know, I almost feel in a way so late to the party because, you know, like I said before, as I felt like that project, you know, I, I could kind of check it off my list and go work on something else, you know, and now it's, now we have to upgrade our software and, and you know, so it's just this never ending catch game of catch up, um, you know, from an expense standpoint, as well as just a time investment standpoint. So, yeah, I mean, you know, there are some stores, um, you know, that I really wanted to do a lot more, uh, renovating in, yeah. um, you know, really kind of look at, you know, putting maybe even some more food service in, um, you know, and, you know, from, a, from a technology, you know, standpoint, you know, the, you, you only have so much to work with. Um, and, and a lot of that, you know, from a time and, and, and money standpoint has been, you know, really wrapped up in EMV for the last two years. Um, right. then, you know, like I said, I had to kind of upgrade all of our internet um, and that, you know, uh, took a lot of time and, and you know, additional funds uh, to, to make sure that we had the, the connectivity speeds that we needed. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I think from a, you know, new products offer standpoint, as well as just kind of a, 
upgrade in customer experience inside the store. It's, it's kind of, you know, we've had to push the pause button on a lot of those things. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the, 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 the one cost that we haven't been able to, to fully capture. You know, we've been able to say it's going to cost the industry $8 billion to put EMV in, but you know, what was the opportunity cost of not being able to do some of these other projects because we're just that yeah. sucking sound, that drain of, yeah, this is just table stakes to stay open. You got to pay this kind of money. Yeah. So yeah. Any other any any other things that come to mind? You want to throw out here? No, you know, I think I think the opportunity with innovation is really with the small operator. Um, you know, but 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 I think that you know one of the things that things have gotten very technical, and um, you know, where I used to be able to you know, be very hands-on and really participate in very technical conversations around POS systems. And, um, you know, maybe today it would have been a mobile app. Um, you know, we don't always have the ability to do that anymore. And, you know, one of the things I think that there, there's just a kind of a huge gap and, and, and it's unfortunate because I think the opportunity lies with us because we will do anything. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I have toyed around with the idea of putting people on roller skates on the forecourt. You know, and I just haven't found somebody willing to roller skate is the only reason we haven't done it. Um, <laughs> so we will do it. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and, and the problem is, is that, you know, when you start throwing out words like tech stack and like, I get like, I get nervous. I'm like, I don't know, you know, what does that mean? Um, you know, and so, so I think there needs, we need to play a little catch up in, you know, making sure that things are easily accessible to, to the small operator, because we're wearing so many hats and trying to speak so many languages when it comes to different programs, you know, different, you know, uh, you know, just, just kind of thoughts and ideas. And, and so, you know, if somebody can help us kind of roll the ball down the pike. We will go as far as, as we can. Um, and, you know, it, it there, you know, it's just a, a shame that some of those things, because they don't connect, if you have an app and a POS system, sometimes they don't connect to each other, which has been, you know, a, cons you know, a complaint of some of my colleagues is, you know, if we can get the help to, to get there, I think, I think, you know, our outlets are kind of almost a lab opportunity for, you know, innovation in the, in the space, if we can work together and make it happen. Yeah, and I think that's something that was echoed by your, you know, your your colleagues on the executive committee. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, it's just, hey, it's great that you guys all have these mobile apps out there and, and you've got 10,000 stores. You know, I got 23 and I can't connect any of them. Or, yeah. you know, Jared talking about uh, you want to do a mobile app and you found that <laughs> how much it really costs. Yeah. So, you know, these are these are headwinds that I think we need to pay attention to. And I think I think Nax is you guys have really brought around the thinking from a Nax perspective as to how we can get more active in making sure that um, the technology is more democratized at a function at a basic level and then a vanilla level so that you can you can paint the picture you want on a canvas that's provided and interoperates with what you got. Uh, I think that's really a goal here. Yeah. And, you know, I think when we try to make things simple for our consumers, I think they have to be simple for us. Um, to be able to use because, you know, one of the things that I think creates a, a, a multitude of frustration for customers is when things don't work. Yeah. Um, you know, when I think of bad interactions with customers, you know, customers at our stores, it's usually around, you know, my, my pump's not working. And so, you know, if we're not careful about developing an app that makes sense from both ends, you've got potentially challenging interactions going on, you know, behind your counter. And then, and then you've got, you know, somebody who's just starting in the work field and, you know, they're, they're having this tense interaction because so-and-so's app didn't work right. Uh, you know, so I think, I think we need to be very simplistic on both ends of things and not, not overcomplicate what's going on in backstage, if you will. Simplify. We heard that one too at the strategy conference, right? Yes. How do we simplify? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that's all part, about simplify. <laughs> yeah, that's part of that reduction of 250 hours to hit that customer experience is simplification, right? Correct. <laughs> so, okay, you wear many hats and um, I actually watched you down, I've, I've watched you programming your own, your own dispenser content. Um, so I know you wear many hats. What do you do to relax? Ah, well, uh, pretty much anything um, that I can just kind of move around and, and uh, go crazy. So I, I, I tend to, to be known to, to lift weights occasionally. Um, I, I enjoy kind of getting into the space where it's, you know, me and, and a barbell and a, and, a, and a bunch of weight. And, you know, I can either pick it up or I can't. Um, you know, I, I find that 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 really helps me kind of focus and, and you know, get out all the stress and, the, and you know, the anxiety for, you know, of the day. Um, I also like to tap dance and um, I also have my black belt in martial arts, <laughs> which 
during a stressful day or, you know, at the completion of a, 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 you know, paying the last invoice for EMV, punching things, I I can't tell you how (laughs) stress relieving that is. And, and, you know, my husband and I take class together. So sometimes we're punching each other, which is also fun. Um, (laughs) So, uh, yeah. I got a a question. What's your best deadlift? Uh, 305. Because you brought that up is that was a big challenge. And I actually saw the picture of you doing the deadlift. I was incredibly impressed. I could never do that. (laughs) And um, um, one other fun fact, by the way, uh, Lisa's husband is a session bassist uh, who has played with some of the best um, artists in in the industry. And he's a really cool guy. So they're they're a very interesting group to hang with. And and, uh, (laughs) we're going to bring this to a close. Lisa, um, I truly appreciate this. I'm going to have you back because, you know, I get so I learned so much from you know what you can tell me about how things are going in in your space. I really enjoy our time. You're a huge advocate for the industry. We really appreciate you participating, and you know it's a big commitment to participate in the executive committee and the governance of Nax, and, and truly, truly appreciate it. So um, thank you very much, and have yourself a great day and great weekend. Go hit somebody. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Hey, Lisa. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for taking the time to be here with us today. And uh, to the audience, sorry we lost Gray. Um, technical difficulties, but we'll just soldier on uh, with Lisa. Um, we do have a couple of questions coming in that I'd like to get over to you. Um, and one of them is many younger people today value and sometimes even demand a flexible work schedule. Um, do you have any strategies? Uh, short-term, long-term strategies on how to accommodate um, the logistics of having a flexible work schedules. It's challenging. Yeah, I mean, that, that certainly, especially with, you know, your younger families, um, that is definitely something that's more important. You know, we haven't, um, it's it, to me, you know, and being a small company and then having a, you know, a small number of employee, employees is we, we've kind of done it on an individual basis. Um, mm-hmm. you know, there's nothing really formalized around it. Um, and, and, you know, it is, slightly problematic in that you know you've got some folks that you know are very much a you know nine to five concepts i come in and i do my work and i go home and you know so it's it's something that needs to be discussed a lot more in our industry um for us you know right now it's, it's very individual you know and, and i kind of you know we are a 24-hour business um right. you know at the management level when when folks need to go and take care of their personal needs there's um we're open <laughs> we're open whenever they they want to come back and and you know i i, I have the the belief that you know if, if people are doing what they need to do um i don't really i don't want to say i don't care um but you know I, I don't mind if they're working non-traditional work schedules i mean i had a manager over the pandemic that worked third shift um because that's what they need mm-hmm. yeah so yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I spent 22 years at a, at a small operator and uh, I think that's one benefit of small operators is they do have the ability to treat their employees as individuals and, you know, be more flexible in that way. And so I think that's an advantage you have um, that some larger companies may not be able to, to manage. Um, so kudos on that. Um, another question is, do you have any examples you could share where you feel locked in or um, prevented from making effective operational decisions, um, specifically by technology? Um, so places where Connexus can focus to maybe relieve a problem for you. Do you feel like uh, there's a, a place where you're locked in that maybe technology could help? You know, I think... There's a couple ways I could answer that, but, you know, I, I think one of the biggest things is, is kind of what I mentioned earlier is that, you know, as technology continues to, to advance, I think that um, one of the things that I think would be really awesome for, for Connexus to, to kind of involve themselves in is, is almost like an, edu- like a, you know, um, you know, some of the uh, educational workshops that NACS has, uh, mm-hmm. you know, partnered with some of the, um, you know, the universities or, you know, a program like that for mm-hmm. almost like, you know, tech for dummies in a way, you know, right. is, is that, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, when I joke around with Gray all the time and I, I tell him that, you know, I need a glossary sometimes just to understand what he's saying <laughs> because I don't, I don't know the acronyms. I don't, you know, and, and like I said, it yeah. used to be really comfortable to plug things in, take this plug out, what happens, you know? And, and so I think, you know, just at the basic level is sometimes we're, we're, we're stopped or paused because, I don't always have the technical expertise to solve a problem. And so when you're depending on third party, 
you know, interaction is that sometimes that's not fast enough. Um, and you could end up creating a lot of really, you know, tense moments for, for your store personnel. And, and so I think that's kind right. of what holds back is, is just kind of that lack of finesse when it comes to making things connect and making things work. Absolutely. And I totally agree with you. I mean, I know that in the 22 years I spent, I went from, you know, dealing with um, G sites to dealing with, you know, touch screens and all these other new yeah. technologies. And, um, you know, you used to be able to like carry three different cables in your bag and be okay. And now you have like 17 different cables that you need. And you're like, I'm like, what is that? Yeah. Like I need a cat five, a cereal and you know, uh, that's it. I'm good. But that those days are gone. And um, we have to, I think you're right. We could use some, some catch up skills and um, that's not a bad idea to have some classes on all the, all the new tech that's out there in our own world. You know, just that's already in our stores today um, because it, it can be challenging. It is very unique, too. I mean, I mean, what we do on the forecourt is, is really unlike any other retail operation. Um, you know, all of the bells and whistles that go along with it. And, you know, the fact that we're trying to entertain our customers and, you know, get them to come into the store with, you know, items and, and, and promotions on the dispensers. It, that's very unique. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, not to mention the you know, the, the environmental monitoring and things like that is, is, you know, there's a lot of technical pieces to making things work and, and connect to them where you need to. And, and uh, I have popped off the bus at some point in terms of, you know, I used to be real savvy and I was like, oh yeah, I got it. And <laughs> now I'm afraid to touch anything. So yeah. I, think, I think, you know, classes for, you know, things that, that are the basics. I think sometimes people are afraid to ask. I don't, I think sometimes right. we don't sound stupid, you know, and, and so when you're talking exactly. about like, Jack and you know I, like sometimes I'm just like <laughs> you know but a lot of times we're afraid to ask because um you know exactly <laughs> yeah uh, very true um I was very interested in your uh concept of the concierge uh fuel delivery I think that's brilliant um I, and I think you could pull it off Lisa I think you could pull it off with a mobile app and you know a small tank wagon uh that you've retrofitted to to somehow dispense gasoline I think you could do it um it, it sounds amazing because I'm with you. I worked for a fuel company, drove a company car. My gasoline was free and I still hated to get gas. And my daughter's always like, what do you mean you hate getting free gasoline? That doesn't make any sense. But it's just the time. Like you said, it's like you're just standing there. Yeah. Yeah. So and I, I think you could pull that off. <laughs> well, if anybody wants a partner on the app side, you know, I... Uh... <laughs> Um, I think I think we haven't changed that system. It's you know since a, a gas pump was developed. Um, Absolutely, gas pump sexier. We really haven't you know um, we haven't changed anything about that delivery system. And as innovative yeah. as we are, and as creative as we are, you know we haven't we haven't changed a thing about that. Yep, I agree. Um, and I appreciated what you said on the uh, four court commerce um, that we need ways to still con you know have personal contact with people. That you know the four court commerce can get us. Um, at least maybe loop in some more customers and keep them engaged, but we still need that personal contact um, and the face-to-face -face, um, interaction. And um, I think that's another area that uh, your stores and other small operators have really um, kind of a an advantage in that you are neighborhood stores and you know people who are coming in and out. And um, I really think that that sets your customer experience apart, having that personal contact. I had a, um, a customer in um, one of the most neighborhood stores that we have um, who used to come in uh, at a certain time of the day when she knew that one of our team members, um, who, who sadly we lost um, a little over a year ago, um, but she would come in and, you know, come in just to converse um, with this woman. Her name was Pat. And so I, I happened to be in the store, you know, during this time frame and she kind of pulled me aside and she said, I just want you to know, like, this interaction has basically saved my life. She's like, you know, I, I moved to the area. I didn't know anybody. And, you know, I would come down here at night because I was lonely and I wanted to interact with someone. And she said, you know, I can't tell you how valuable that was to me. And when I think about automating things and taking that opportunity away, right. um, you don't know what people are dealing with. And, you know, we, 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 we talk about this a lot in our industries that we can be the best part of someone's day. And um, I, I really value that. I think that's super important. I agree. And I think that um, like we, we, when I was in the retail world, um, we had, you know, we would have 
really great uh, cashiers and associates who would leave us for factory work and then come back because that world just wasn't for them because they were such people persons that they needed to interact with people and you know our world is perfect for that we're perfect um, employment place for someone who likes talking to people and likes interacting with people and um, I think we need to value them and appreciate them um, but you're right I mean I, I know that uh, I think I told you this story that um, you know, that I passed two stores on my way to the office when I was working for retail and I would go out of my way to go to a different store because of the the lady who did the coffee at that store. And she was like my grandma, you know, she just would, you know, she pats your hand and says, how's your day? You look so pretty today. And, you know, it just made my day better. Um, so I think we do have that opportunity to impact people and to keep that personal contact going. Um, I think that's valuable. Um, and I do think it's challenging um, tech wise to stay up to date. Like you said, you know, you get EMV done and now you have to upgrade your software, your point of sale software, just so you can do mobile pay and then you have to upgrade your Internet. Um, you know, I mean, it's never ending. And I'm sure once you get your Internet upgraded at all your sites that are possible, then there's something else waiting in the wings for you. Um, <laughs> it's challenging to as a small operator to, to you know, navigate all of that. Um, and uh, I was interested that you said you outsource your IT. And um, I mean, do you have a struggle with keeping them up to date on like just dealing with flammable liquids? I mean, <laughs> most people don't understand that. But like, an everyday part of your life is, you know, <laughs> hey, I have to keep track of thousands of gallons of flammable liquid. Um, fire. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, I mean, mostly, you know, like I said, we, we have a fabulous petroleum service company, um, you know, the, the guys that are on their team are, are you know, well-versed. And so, you know, they've had to also, you know, over the last 10 years, we'll say, God, I feel old, um, but, you know, they've had to, you know, also educate themselves on a much more kind of internet of things education. And um, so, so, you know, as far as like work or connectivity, um, you know, I can depend on those guys, you know, 110%. So most of what these guys are doing is is inside, but like they just don't understand, like, you know, where, where the rubber meets the road is always the problem. I'm sorry, I have my dog uh, remotes here because they're going to start barking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <Don't but>, you <laughs> know. Um, so I've, I've been able to keep the, those guys away from flammable liquids, which is a good thing. Um, but, you know, That's great. You know, trying to get things to talk to each other and, and for them to understand, you know, what we need. Um, because, you know, like I said, the, the Internet speeds just blew my mind in terms of what we actually needed versus what we had. Um, you know, so so it's a lot of connecting things and making things talk to each other, which is, you know, the hardest part, I think. Um, right. Right. And I think the other struggle is, is and especially I think this is important for small operators is um, security. You know, you because you want everything in your store to talk, you know, we've we've entered we, we can kind of complain about the, the technology age we're in. But now you can, you know, have your cooler talk to you. You can have your canopy talk to you. You can have every your your hot dog roller grill talk to you, your pizza oven talk to you. You can have everything in the store talk to you. The, the struggle there is how does that impact your um, Internet security and your PCI compliance? Yep. And, you know, you want to do those things and you want to be innovative, but how do you make sure it's all secure? It's challenging. Yeah. And, and you know, those conversations start to get, you know, slightly over my head, I think, when it comes to, you know, and so, so I think sometimes as a small operator, we stay away from a lot of that stuff because we don't want to create a situation where, you know, we're welcoming in whoever wants to just kind of hack into the system because th those folks are, are smarter than, <laughs> than a lot of us. And I, I can't believe so. Totally. It's, it's insane. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, like, you know, I swear there are like 15 year old kids who are smarter than me on this stuff and, you know, can hack into anything they want to. Um, and which is a little terrifying. Um, but so I we guess I guess we just have to find a way to to embrace innovation without being crazy, you know, and stupid. <laughs> don't be don't be stupid about it. <laughs> but um, well, Lisa, I appreciate your time today and it has been great talking to you. You are an amazing speaker. Thank you for your time and for sharing your wisdom for small operators. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Oh, it's been great. Uh, and to all our attendees, thank you so much for coming today. Thanks for your time. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks. Thank you.